Okay, this is Jimmy John, and you're listening to Motor City Rock Talk. Today, my guest is a legendary lead vocalist from a band that was out in the late 80s, early 90s called Sassy Cat. Had a lot of success, played with a lot of national artists. Anyway, my guest today is a lead vocalist, Craig Black. How you doing, man? Great, how you doing? I'm doing good. All right, let's start out with a little background. Where are you originally from? Detroit, South, Southwest Detroit. Oh, okay, that's cool. And did the band pretty much start out there in area too, or? Everyone's on Metro Detroit. Metro Detroit, much. okay. So not East Side then? No, no. Okay, pretty much, let me know a little bit about how the band started. How'd you guys get together? I was in a band with Joe Neely called Nightingale, and it really wasn't my thing. I was a little older than those guys. Yeah. I just left that. I didn't really care for it. One day, Phil Gajewski came up to me in Harpo's. He was a friend of Joe's brother, Art Neely. Mm -hmm. He said, Phil is looking for a band. And I said, yeah, and uh, I know a drummer, Randy, and we both knew Joe already. And we went over to German Heights and Mitchell Angelos' house in the basement. And the first click, man, it just hit. First time we all did anything, just totally polished off and sounded great. Wow. And that was that. Oh, that's pretty cool. Have you always uh, been a singer, or do you play guitar or anything also? Back then, I was a singer, but I play uh, more of a strummer, acoustic and stuff now. Oh, okay. Were you part of the writing process, the band, for those uh, songs? I wrote, I wrote all the lyrics and helped like, arrange a couple of the songs. Oh, okay. That's cool. And where, where'd you go to high school, did you say? I started here in Redford High which is no longer there in Detroit. Oh, okay. Then I, uh, my mom remarried in like 81 or something. We moved to Kentucky for like two years. Then I came back when I was 18 all by myself. Been here ever since. It must have kind of a different thing going to Kentucky from Detroit. Did you have relatives there? Is that why you guys moved there? Yeah, the guy that uh, she married had a twin brother was actually married to my mom's sister. Oh, wow. Kind of, so I had cousins and all kinds of stuff there. So I didn't like it, so I came back. Were you uh, playing in any bands when you were in Kentucky, or were you too young? No. Time? What were some of the clubs that you guys played here? I know you opened up for, like, to say, some national acts. What were some of the clubs you guys were frequenting back in the day? Our very first show was in uh, June of 89 at Slammers. Oh, Slammers, yeah. You remember that? Oh, yeah. I played with Matt Hatter. I think the only time on the west side that we actually opened up or something. It was so packed that Blondie's called and they put us on our, our, our second show with Dangerous Toys at, at Blondie's, the old Blondie's. Yeah. Then the Tolkien called. Phil is good friends with uh, Harry Lavoine. I'm not sure if he's from Rated R, Brotherhood Recipe. Mm -hmm. he, he was booking shows for like Clutch Cardinals and St. Andrews. So then we got into St. Andrews, then I walked from there to the Ritz, Harpo's, New York, New York, Latin Quarter. Then I walked from there to the Ritz, Harpo's, New York, New York, Latin Quarter. It was all over the place. We were pretty much everywhere. Did you go out of state at all? Never. No? Didn't go to Ohio That's or Indiana? That's my one regret. Kind of like Elvis, never left the country. <laughs> right. <laughs> out of these clubs you played, as far as like the sound or the response you got, you know, from the fans and all that, were there out of those clubs, particular ones that you like to play at better than others? I would say Tolkien. Studio Lounge, St. Andrews, and the Ritz. Yeah. Those are probably my four favorites. Now, was that because of the, the response you got or because of the sound there? Because I know the studio was horrific, the sound. Funny thing, the very first show we ever did at Slammers, the sound guy was Jerry Fredicki. Oh, wow. N never met the guy or knew nothing about him. And we was talking. He lived like 10 houses down from me on the same street over in Warrendale. And then, uh, he was like our sound guy every time on the west side and cool chris would do like yeah. st andrews and stuff like that whatever but i i, I think token i like that song yeah that's kind cool. of loud a loud song sometimes studio is kind of small right blondie like i can't even remember blondie's well blondie's was ritz, a lot of fun the ritz was great oh, that's probably why i don't remember it <laughs> <laughs> but uh the ritz yeah, they had probably the best sound to me oh yeah absolutely either that or possibly harpos you guys did you say you played harpos we played there once one uh, time okay now uh as for the album where'd you guys record that sugarloo studios and romulus it was actually uh scott our other guitar players uncles like down in his basement mm -hmm. now the first four songs we did in like once the early 90 or fall of 90. Right. And we actually finished those four songs. Right. Then we went back in at like 91, 
and did those other seven, which we ne never even finished. We, we played them, I think we ran out of money, and, and then Scott started hauling, and that's when everything changed from like grunge and all that. And then every, you can even tell from those first four to the sec those seven that it sounds different, like totally different music. And then we just like graduated and kind of moved on, started doing this other stuff, even though I, I always wanted to go back and finish those seven songs. They're not mixed, they're not finished. I just tell everyone they're demos. But uh, Scott came in, man, every day with a new new uh, song, whatever. And they were gr great songs. Right. We never got never got to record any of those. Yeah, like you said, you can tell that the first four were mixed, but like you said, those other seven, despite the fact that they're not mixed, as you say, they are solid songs and they sound pretty damn good. You know, better than an average demo song, that's for sure. You hear like the sticks counting off. There's one song, Garden of Stone. I actually found, like we all had a copy of that first one with the four songs, mm -hmm. but no one had a copy of those other seven. And one time in my old house in Detroit, I was just rummaging through some stuff and found like old tape. Right. And it was it was all ate up. I had to like cut pieces off and put it back together. And that was that actual tape. And then in Garden of Stone, there was a, a piece missing. Obviously, I cut it off. But on the flip side of that tape was all the songs with just the music with no vocals. And Phil was had found a way to cut that, slice it in, and put it in there. But there's one part of a chorus where there's no singing in it. It just cuts out until there's like uh, something missing, whatever. But it, it, it and we, we, at least we salvaged that. Now, did you guys, at any time, the first four songs, were those out for release? Did you have like a cassette or, or some kind of EP for those? No, that, that was all. Uh, we didn't put that thing together until like 2002 after I found that tape. Oh, oh okay. We had uh, the cassette of the first four on the kind of thing we'd like shopping around, whatever. Right. The rest of that stuff we put together all in one like little CDs. And... Did you have any success with shopping it around at all? Mm, obviously, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we didn't. No. Like I said, everything was changing. Yeah. And that everything and that name is Sassy Cat. That's all my fault. That, that was a terrible name for for that band at that time, whatever. Why do you think that? I don't know. I found the name. I was doing deliveries downtown, and we couldn't think of a name. And I was uh, driving down Woodburn. There was this old porn theater called the Sassy Cat, and, and that's where I got the name. I'm like, oh, cool. You know, that's that's when Guns N' Roses and L.A. Guns they yeah. were all did that whole the whole street sleaze thing, whatever. So. Yeah. It, 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 it kind of worked. All the girls loved it, but man, the guys and other bands, they always they, they tease us, like call Sissy, Sissy Cat or Sassy uh, Scratch, whatever. I don't know if they were jealous or what, but it, it wasn't a good jealous. name. Probably it wasn't a good name. That's a, I think that's a cool name, and it would have been very fitting for that time, like you said, Guns and Rose, Jelly Guns. Right, right. I, I think that's a, that's a cooler name. So you pretty much picked the name. Did you, you had said on the songs that you wrote all the lyrics and Correct. you helped put the stuff together so who did you guys write the, or the rest of the band just write the stuff out of jams or did somebody present the no someone always came in with something and usually phil on the first the first four songs i think three out of the four were phil and i would just bring in an old tape recorder and tape all the music then go home and put words to it then uh on the second i think it was like half and half half phil half scott then after that scott just like took over started bringing all the stuff in. great song man. oh thank you the other thing i was going to ask you was when you guys were playing out who were some of the national acts that you opened for like i said the first one was dangerous toys st andrews we had like babylon ad Shaka Messiah, Bang Tango, Saigon Kick, a Soundgarden, believe it or not. Wow, Soundgarden, darn it. My Sister's Machine. Now, how we, did you uh, get these gigs? Did you have management at the time, or did you just buy No, music? no, that all goes back to Perry Lavoin. He uh, threw us on all these gigs, whatever. He, he felt that we like fit the bill perfect with those other bands, so he put us with it. We did a show at Blondie's. Remember the Skid Row video, 18 in Life? Yeah, yeah. There's two guys in that video who were actually in a band from L.A. or whatever, and uh, they played Blondie's, and they actually opened for us. Oh, really? So that was cool. We played with Gene Loves Jezebel mm -hmm. at Latin Qu Latin Quarter. You ever, you ever heard of that? Oh yeah. But that's that's for all, all the ones I can think of. I know it's it's quite a while ago. Now, uh, what, are you still performing in any way now? I mean, I know the band's defunct and all that. I kind of lost my voice. I had like some uh, I had like a tumor in my thyroid. They removed. 
it. And I got chronic, like a post-nasal drip, and it just wipes out my vocal cords. So I've done, like, recording, like, my own stuff, whatever, just acoustic and all that. Mm -hmm. I've never, I never went back out and done anything, like, real, real stuff. Didn't have any interest in doing that because of your vocals? That's why I had to quit the band in the first place. It just, I couldn't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. I lose my voice. I had to cancel shows. So that was a while ago that that happened to you. Beautiful. That was, like, 92. Oh, jeez. 30 years already. Yeah. So how, did they end up going on without you at all? Did they replace you with another no. singer? Joe went on to, to play with uh, Concrete Rattle. Oh, yeah, yeah, with Rob. Right, right, Rob and JT. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Phil never did anything. I think Scott and Randy had a band just for a brief brief time, kind of like an alternative band right. called Bob, Bob Slut. I think they played like one or two shows. And then, uh, who am I missing? Oh, Rob. Phil left the band like by the end of 91. Rob Ludwig from Romeo Rock mm -hmm. joined with us. And he went on to uh, play with One Man's Trash right. for a little bit. Now, the other thing I was wondering, because listening to the, to the CD and all that, especially the first four tracks, was there any bands in particular at that time or even before then that more or less influenced you guys as far as the style of music you're playing or the way you were writing songs? Yeah, probably like, like Guns N' Roses, Phil grew up a big Van Halen fan, mm -hmm. but we didn't we didn't really play anything like that. To me, it was like Guns N' Roses, L.A. Guns, Skid Row, that kind of stuff, Bang Tangle. We all kind of liked whatever was popular at the time. I didn't know if, like, the... from earlier in your in your years, there was something like Zeppelin or the Stones or anything to help in, or Aerosmith. Because I see a little, I hear a little bit of Aerosmith, that swag, that swaggery kind of sound in that too. So I just That's cool. Like that. Never heard that. I no? like that. Yeah. No, but I can hear the L.A. Guns stuff because it was, you know, it was part of that prime period. Yet, obviously, but all that stuff, including those bands, were influenced by like, like Aerosmith and, and some of the earlier 70s rock. Yeah, I grew up loving like like ACDC, mm -hmm. the early stuff. Kiss, obviously, I wonder. Of course. Uh, Alice Cooper, stuff like that, Bowie. I was older than all those other guys, so I, I like like little older stuff. I was figuring you might. So, your very, did you say your very first gig was at, was at Blondie's? Is that what you said, or no? No, uh, Slammers. Slammers, Slammers. And were you the opening act at that show, or the headline? We uh, opened up for a band called Rocks. Oh, uh, R-O-X-X? Yes, correct. Yeah. Joey and uh, Jamie. I actually grew up with Jamie. Didn't know he was in a band. I grew up in Southwest with him. And Jerry predicted was the sound guy. And like I said, we just, we just connected from there. We did a lot of our shows. Yeah, you mentioned something about Warrendale. Is that where you guys uh, would rehearse from? Was the house in Warrendale? I was living in Warrendale. Randy was like in Taylor, Phil, Durban Heights, Joey, Westland. Then later we had Scott, and he was down like Trenton, somewhere okay. down there. Well, the reason I ask about Warrendale, because uh, I lived for a time with my band in Warrendale, Granville. Really? Yeah, and there was a club that we used to we used to play there, and I was wondering if you played there. It was originally called the Student Body Lounge, and then it became Walsh's on the Border. Right yeah, there. yeah, yeah. Did you guys play there? No, no. No. I, I wanted to see other bands play there. Yeah, because I think it would have fit in perfectly. I, I remember seeing Halloween play there, Seduce. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, they were all, they all pretty much play. It wasn't a very big place. It I think like, I've seen Bobby Bobby Easter. We went and seen him. Yeah, it was. I went to Henry Ford Community College, and like I said, it was originally a, called the Student Body Lounge because it was a hangout with the college kids. But uh, it, what it, year would that have been around? Oh, uh, 81, 82, somewhere in there. Oh, uh, that's I was still in Kentucky, huh? Yeah, like I said, we lived right down. We had a band house right down the street from it, so we used to hang out there quite a bit, you know, and invite the bands back to our place for after hours. Who are some of your favorite local bands that you can recall from that time? Oh, God. When I came back from Kentucky, it was 84, and, and my uh, best friend, David Miller, we was living in Brightmore then. And we used to go, we didn't really know what we were doing. We just we was of age, of age meaning 18, to get in the bar. So we went to like, I think the Token first and Blondies. We would go to the Token, get dropped off, to see Seduce, and then walk home at 2.30 in the morning from, from Livonia all the way to Brightmore. That's how dedicated we were. Yeah. I don't think I don't think we missed a Seduce show. Oh, and, I think at ha ha Halloween, we loved, loved Halloween, weapons. Who else was there? Uh, Somebody at Scarlet, remember them? Abuse. Yeah, yeah. 
we just had a almighty straw. We just had a blast. That's we funny. couldn't even drink. We sneak liquor in and <laughs> do, do our thing and walk home. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned Brightmore because I lived for a time in Brightmore also. We're off of Burt Road. That's where all Seduce lived. They had the band house. Yeah, I know. Well, they had a couple actually. They had one in Dearborn also. That was uh, probably a little bit more of a infamous. They also had one open Romulus, the very first one. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, you, well, I know across. Across Schoolcraft on the other side, we used to party over there with a band house with a happy death man. Yeah. And the, and the meanie house and angster, my God. Yeah, I was going to say the meanies and all that. Did you ever do any games with them? We did uh, a say, um, Slammers. I can't remember. Maybe going into 91, a New Year's Eve gig with them. And then we did like a couple of like, uh, benefit shows, I think at St. Andrews in New York, New York. They were all like real, I was good friends with all those guys, all the bands really. Yeah. And a lot of the Detroit bands. God, that was a cool time. That was such a cool oh, time. Oh, it was. Especially, especially, like I said, it was in the 80s and all that, because you could go out any night of the week practically and see somebody playing somewhere. East Side Six, Absolutely. 24 Carat, Silverbird, whatever. It was always somebody playing. And I was always like a huge fan of Seduce. Like you said, I, I still never... listened to them. I listened to them yesterday. Yeah, I, I, I still dig those guys and stuff. I'm hoping that they'll get back. They got to eventually do it on the show of Token or something. I know Mark was saying something about this a couple of years ago we recording some new stuff yeah i know the last show they did at the token he talked about that they played some stuff but uh everything's kind of on hold and all that and that kind of sucks My... yeah what are you gonna do right so is, is there any hope at all or do you have any ambition to possibly um have those seven songs on the cd actually ever mix for any for any reason even if it's just for personal reasons to have it no what happened was uh we were gonna do that and we went to his uncle's house, and there was a flood, and everything in that basement got ruined and thrown out, completely gone. Oh, wow. Uh, I know. Uh, tell me about it. So was that was that originally on, like, that tape or something, or Real to Real? What was it recorded on initially? It was a Real to Real. Real to Real? Yeah, it really I think sucks. Both, both, yeah, both seven songs are completely gone. Wow. That one tape's all that was left in this world. Yeah. And then the reason it sounds so high-pitched, we had to, someone had um, filled patch that part and we gave it to Mitchell Andrews. He did some program where he brought it up louder, but it makes it sound more like a higher, higher kidney pitch. Originally it would have been great if we could have finished that. Yeah, because uh I had put it on because I needed to, you know, have companion music for this interview and all that. And I had a couple comments on it. Uh, some guy from uh, from Mexico said it was really cool. He really dug it. And another guy said this was really, this was kind of cool. He said the songs were cool or good. And if Ted Templeton had gotten a hold of it, they would have been <laughs> phenomenal. I don't know if you, you know who Ted Templeton is, of course. We did Van no. Halen and all that. We did yeah, all right, right. those bands. So it, it's getting a good response. It, it's a lot of people listening to it and digging it and all that so you know to me are you familiar it, with uh are you familiar with john patrick jp mm, no he was in a band called illusion okay. which i never even heard of back in, in the 80s but he had i would say the early 2000s for about 10 years he had a website called motor city rock oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah and he yeah. had every everything on there yeah. I mean, every band that ever played in the 80s, all their shows, songs. Flyers and whatnot. Pictures. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He contacted me. He's listened to the show and wanted to, to sell me that whole site because he's not doing it anymore. It's yeah, not he couldn't afford anymore. it. Right. He, wanted, he didn't want the ads. He didn't want no ads on it. Right, and the upkeep on it. I thought about it for a while. It'd be interesting, you know, just for contact information and knowing how to get some of these, some of these bands that I may have forgotten in the past. There so, were so many. You know, so many oh, it cool was, bands. It was all, I contributed a lot of them. And then he was doing benefit shows. I think Halloween did one. The Meanies did one. Yeah. I think Heaven's Wish did one. It was, it was pretty cool, man. Yeah, Heaven's Wish is another band that we're going to be talking to next month. We're getting ready to play down at that uh, wind up. Yeah, District 142. That's why he wanted to do the interview a little later. Are you still in contact at all with the, any of the guys from the band? Yeah, I talk to most, uh, Joe quite often. Phil, we text back, talk every now and then. Scott, no, not as much. Randy, he moved to Florida, so he's on Facebook, whatever, but I haven't heard from him in a long time. Are any of those guys still playing? No. No? Pretty no. much 
decided that was it. He had to, uh, he had to be in the sun. Mary family. Yeah, I I totally understand that. Uh, anyway, I can't really think of anything else unless you have something you want to mention and all that. No, just thanks thanks for having me. Bring back some old memories. Yeah, I really appreciate talking to you today. You taking the time and all that and no problem. I enjoy your show. I appreciate it, man. I, all right, Craig, all right, man. You, you take it easy, man. You have a good one. All right, happy New Year, bro. You too, brother. Thanks. All right, bye. Bye bye. Anyway, that was Craig Black from uh, Sassy Cat, originally vocalist. And I'd like to mention real quick, if you're digging the show and you're liking the interviews, you want to hear some more good stuff coming out in the next year, if you could please hit the like button and subscribe. It would really help the channel out. Anyway, with that said, this is Jimmy Jive saying, keep rocking.